mid-1920s, the Regia Marina looked to expand and counter the growing threat of the Marine Nationale in the Mediterranean as the French had augmented their cruiser and destroyer forces with newer and more capable vessels, leading the Regia Marina to create the new Zara class, of which we will discuss the lead ship of the class, Zara. She was completed in October 1931, and throughout the 1930s, she participated in naval reviews, drills, and other peacetime activities. When Italy joined the Second World War in June 1940, she was the flagship of the 1st Cruiser Division. She participated in the Battle of Calabria, avoiding torpedoes and firing on HMS Warspite. After the battle, she was present in Taranto during the raid in November 1940, although she was not damaged. Her final major action was the Battle of Cape Matapan, where she was sent to help her crippled sister, Pola. And in the process, Zara was destroyed by British gunfire. Where to quote Maurizio Brescia in his book Mussolini's Navy, a reference guide to the Regia Marina, 1930-1945, the four Zara-class ships were surely the best Italian heavy cruisers, and the exceptional conditions of the loss of Zara and Fiume at Matapan, wrecked by 15-inch shells at almost point-blank range, do not allow for a fair judgment of their robustness to be made. At the Battle of Spartivento, Pola hit the cruiser HMS Barrack with two 8-inch shells, knocking out one of her 8-inch turrets. In the brief gunfire action of the First Battle of Sirte in December 1941, Gorizia damaged the destroyer HMS Kipling with a near miss. Where our story starts, that fate at Cape Matapan is over a decade away. For the sake of our story, we'll start at the beginning of 1928. But the Franco-Italian rivalry was in full swing, as the Trento class was just about to come into service, and the Marine Nationale was countering with their own new class, and more to come, not to mention the various light cruisers and destroyers being built. To get some perspective on the rivalry, we'll look at Franco-Italian Rivalry, Current History, 1916-1940, Volume 38, Number 3, by B.Z. Goldberg, from June of 1933, who opens up by saying, quote, the immediate danger to the peace of Europe lies somewhere between Rome and the implacable Balkans, for Italy has dared to challenge French hegemony. Germany, despite all her potential might and menace, is but the background to the impending, possibly final, struggle between Caesar and Gaul. France still finds it difficult to see in Italy an adversary worthy of the name. She has not forgotten the adage of Metternich that Italy is not a nation but a geographical expression, nor can she forget how Italy rose to nationhood. Since Napoleon III concluded the hasty armistice at Villafranca, France has been trying to curb Italian aspirations. In such a policy, Italy finds grounds for deep resentment, to which the divisions of spoils at Versailles only added. To not fall behind, the leaders, admirals of the Regia Marina, look to design and build new ships. Discussions range from the construction of new medium displacement battleships of about 23,000 tons to smaller vessels like heavy cruisers. In these discussions, the weaknesses of the Trento class were discussed, with some leaders feeling that they were too vulnerable and that the Italian navy should strive for qualitative superiority over France. For the uninitiated in naval design at the time, this translates to treaty-breaking time, where the Regia Marina came to some conclusions. To take from Maurizio Brescia and Augusto de Toro and Italian heavy cruisers, Trento to Bolzano, displacement should not be fixed a priori first, and therefore, the 10,000-ton requirement of the Treaty of Washington should not be taken into account. An extensive vertical protection of 200 millimeters should be ensured, together with strong horizontal protection and a robust hull structure. The main armament was to be maintained at eight 203 millimeter guns. As for large light cruisers, a few knots of speed could be given up compared to the Trento, ensuring a maximum speed in operational conditions of 32 knots instead of 35. Not everyone was thrilled about the idea of breaking the Washington Naval Treaty, namely the Ministry of the Navy, where they stipulated that these new cruisers should fall under the treaty stipulations, meaning that to do so, the ambitious armor scheme had to be cut down. The main characteristics of the ship when constructed were a 10,000-ton standard displacement, although when complete, it was more like 11,900, eight 203mm guns, a maximum speed of 32 knots, and only 150 millimeters of vertical protection and 70 millimeters of horizontal protection. The reduction of speed and increase in armor is an interesting point as it marks kind of a shift in thinking for the Regia Marina, where I think another quote is apt. The reduction of three knots in speed concerning the Trentos was not considered a disadvantage from a tactical point of view, 
As it could not be assumed that Italian ships would engage the enemy only if they had a higher speed than all the ships they might encounter. Greater defensive qualities, therefore, and not a superior speed. As a rising star of Italian naval thinking, Giuseppe Fioravanzo would soon theorize. With these first two ships, the Italian navy adopted the criterion that since quantitative superiority could not be achieved, qualitative superiority should be sought through the development of hidden qualities, capable of gaining the upper hand on the battlefield. Like other Italian heavy cruisers of the period, Zara and the other ships of the class were named after Italian cities that were acquired after the Great War. Zara was laid down on July 4th, 1929, launched on April 27th, 1930, and completed on October 20th, 1931. She displaced 11,900 tons standard displacement and almost 15,000 tons full load. Her armament consisted of eight 203mm guns and twin turrets, two forward and two aft. Originally, she carried 16 120mm guns, which in 1937 was reduced to 12. Along with having various light anti-aircraft guns, ranging from 13.2mm machine guns to 37mm guns. Her machinery consisted of eight boilers that gave steam to two shafted geared turbines, giving 110,000 shaft horsepower on trials and 35.2 knots. In operational conditions, it was more like 30 to 31 knots. Her armor was 150mm at the waterline, a 70mm deck, and 150mm conning tower, and the face of the turrets was the same. After she was complete and worked up, she joined the 1st Division in March of 1932, and was fully operational by May, becoming the flagship for the 1st Squadron and 1st Division in 1933, and after her sisters came into service, the divisions were reorganized by class. Through the coming years, the ships participated in numerous reviews for foreign dignitaries, where some truly spectacular photos were taken. An interesting possibility was the bombardment of Alexandria in January of 1936, as tensions grew between Rome and London over the invasion of Abyssinia, or today, Ethiopia. The heavy cruisers were to bombard ships in Alexandria and use their great speed to escape. Of course, this did not happen, but something interesting that was considered. By June of 1940, when Italy joined the Second World War, Zara was serving as flagship for Admiral Pellegrino Matucci in the 1st Cruiser Division, with her sisters Fiume and Gorizia, ready for action. Unlike the Italian army in North Africa, which faced supply and logistics issues, ports like Tripoli, Benghazi, or Tobruk had not been properly readied for war. This leads us to early July, when an important Italian convoy, consisting of a passenger liner and five freighters, loaded with a little over 2,000 men, tanks, vehicles, and critically 16,000 tons of fuel and supplies, departed Naples and Catania for Benghazi on July 6th. Initially, only the 2nd Cruiser Squadron, the 10th Destroyer Squadron, and 6 torpedo boats had been allocated to escort this convoy. Once learning the British were putting out in force for a different reason, the Regia Marina put out with two battleships, the Conte de Cavour and Giulio Cesare, along with six light cruisers and 20 destroyers from Taranto, led by Vice Admiral Igno Campioni, along with Vice Admiral Riccardo Palladini aboard his flagship Pola, his six heavy cruisers including Zara in the 1st Division, four light cruisers, and 16 destroyers from several bases in Sicily. After Mirza el Kabir, the British position in the Mediterranean was strained. To help strengthen it, the British intended to re-establish Malta as a major base, wherein it was decided to reduce the number of non-combatant servicemen and dependents on the island. These were to be removed in two small convoys. Admiral Andrew Cunningham was to interpose his Mediterranean fleet between these convoys and the likely route Italian surface forces would take. Simultaneously, Force H under James Somerville would create a diversion by ridding Cagliari in Sardinia. Cunningham left Alexandria late on the 7th of July. The front of his force was Admiral Tovey's five light cruisers, followed by his flagship Warspite and five destroyers. Bringing up the rear was the slow group, comprising the battleships Malaya and Royal Sovereign, the carrier Eagle, and ten more destroyers. The British were spotted on the 7th by an Italian submarine. The following morning on the 8th, the British submarine Phoenix sighted the enemy main body, reporting it as midway between Italy and Benghazi, heading south. The convoy the Italian main body was protecting reached North Africa later. At 10 a.m., Italian aircraft flew out of the Dodecanese in Libya, subjecting Cunningham's fleet to a series of high-level bombing attacks. With one bomb hitting the cruiser Gloucester and near misses lightly damaging Warspite and Malaya, 
Well, at 3 p.m., the Italian main body turned eastward to meet the British as the British steered roughly northwest. Decoded British radio signals led the Italians to expect Cunningham off the Calabrian coast at noon on the 9th, with Mussolini ordering Campioni to postpone battle so that Regia Aeronautica could attack the British the next day. By 6.40, both Italian fleets, Palladini's cruisers, and Campioni's battleships were headed northwest. The morning of the 9th at 7.32 a.m., Sunderland's from Malta found Campioni's fleet and tracked him for nearly four hours. It gave enough time for Eagle to launch an airstrike, but not until 1.15 p.m. did a group of nine swordfish who found Palladini's cruisers launching torpedoes at Zara and other heavy cruisers, which all missed. The sight of carrier planes told Campioni that British warships were nearby. His cruisers launched six more float planes, one of which located the British 80 miles away to the northeast. Campioni, who had maneuvered his forces around, began to reverse course back to engage the enemy, where at 110, he received instructions concerning an engagement. This comes from Italian battleships Conte de Cavour and Duilio classes 1911-1956 by Ermino Bagnesco and Augusto de Toro. Meanwhile, at 1310, instructions had arrived from Supermarina concerning the criteria to be followed in any encounter. Not to distance themselves too far from aeronaval bases to allow preemptive or contemporaneous air attacks. To engage, if possible, the enemy battleships separately, being aware of the different speeds. Delaying surface contact to allow the air force to do damage to the enemy. To withdraw the battleships at sunset, to engage the torpedo craft at night. Cunningham headed northwest until 2.15pm when satisfied he had positioned himself in between Campioni and Taranto. His ships steaming in the three groups I mentioned previously, with Tovey's cruisers first spotting smoke on the horizon a half an hour later at 2.47. Gloucester had been sent to support Eagle, leaving a limited amount of cruisers. Zara and the other heavy cruisers were swinging into position at around 3.20 and began engaging the British cruisers and battleships. After the shooting faded away for a time and Campioni steered to engage Warspite and the other British battleships, Zara and the other heavy cruisers were ahead of Cesare and engaging Tovey's light cruisers as the battleships duked it out. Tovey was at a distinct disadvantage facing the Italian heavy and light cruisers. By a little after 4pm, Tovey was overtaken by Palladini and Pola and the other Italian cruisers. However, when Giulio Cesare was hit by Warspite, it caused Campioni to react and order his forces to retreat, not knowing the extent of the damage to his battleship. At 4.06, Palladini was ordered to withdraw. Zara continued to fire at Warspite through a gap in the smoke between 412 and 417, straddling the ship. By 420, the battle was effectively over for Zara. After the battle, there was time to reflect. From De Toro and Bagnesco, in conclusion, both fleets had accomplished their respective missions, allowing their convoys to reach their destinations unharmed. On the Italian side, it was the first wartime test of air-naval cooperation and employment at sea, the air arm. Results were disappointing and, from certain aspects, worrying. They go on to describe how reconnaissance was good, but the doctrine and execution of the air attack was less than ideal, with about 2,000 bombs dropped by 500 aircraft and only one hit. Following this, there was no action for Zara in the Middle Sea besides covering convoys and several small operations. After the raid on Taranto in early November 1940, and the reshuffling of the Regia Marina due to the damage and the fact that Taranto was not safe for fleet units, the British commenced another convoy operation to Malta and then on to Alexandria. Three Royal Navy fleets in the theatre were used as either a covering force in the case of Force H under James Somerville and Force D both from Gibraltar, or as a diversionary force in the case of the Mediterranean fleet from Alexandria under the command of Admiral Cunningham. Once the Italian High Command or Supermarina learned about the convoy operation NB9, they put out to sea on the 26th to interpose themselves between the convoy and Malta. Two Italian fleets consisting of the first fleet with the battleships Vittorio Veneto and Giulio Cesare, along with destroyers under the command of Admiral Campioni, as well as the second Italian fleet under Vice Admiral Iacchino with Pola, the other heavy and light Italian cruisers, and destroyers. A cruiser that was missing from the action was, of course, Zara, as she was having maintenance done during this time and therefore didn't participate in the battle. A battle she did participate in was the Battle of Cape Matapan, where she would meet her end. By late March 1941, the war in the Mediterranean having expanded, 
The Regia Marina intended to sink troop convoys heading from Egypt to Greece in company with the Regia Aeronautica and the German Luftwaffe. To defend against such an attack, Admiral Andrew Cunningham put to sea with Warspite, Valiant, Barham, and the carrier Formidable, screened by cruisers and destroyers. The ensuing Battle of Cape Matapan between the 27th and 29th of March 1941 was one of the most decisive fleet engagements of the war in the Mediterranean. Following the action off Gavdos and the battle between Iachino's flagship Vittorio Veneto, his cruisers under Sansonetti, and the British cruisers under Prudhomme Whipple. During this, the British began sending carrier-based and land-based air attacks against the Italian ships, targeting the Vittorio Veneto. However, Pola, who hadn't played a large part in the engagement, was the unfortunate recipient of one of those British torpedoes and had to slow down not to hit her sister Fiume. Pola lost electrical power and drifted to a stop. Once Cunningham learned of the plight of Pola, he sent ships to hunt for the Italians along with spotter planes to see what the disposition of the Italian fleet was. By nightfall, both Italian and British fleets were splintering into separate formations as Iachino learned of Pola's plight at 8.10pm, in which some suggested sending destroyers to pick up the crew and scuttle the ship. Iachino refused this because of information from Supermarina, in which he thought the enemy formation 75 miles to his east was Prudhomme Whipple's cruisers. He felt that the 1st Cruiser Division could handle them. Iachino had this to say about his decision later. I had not the slightest idea that we were pursued so closely by the British fleet. Otherwise, I should not have abandoned the Pola to her fate. So the 1st Cruiser Division, including Zara and Fiume, went to assist Pola alongside with the 9th Destroyer Squadron. At 10.10pm, as Valiant's radar pinpointed Pola about 6 miles to the southwest of the British battleships Warspite, Barham, and Valiant, Vice Admiral Cataneo, in charge of the 1st Cruiser Division, approached from the south with Fiume's crew getting ready to pass a tow to Pola. The night was moonless and cloudless, and visibility was not great, hovering at about 5,000 yards. Lookouts on Pola sighted shapes to the north, and believing they were friendly, they fired a red flare to advertise their location. Zara saw the flare 45 degrees off her port bow and turned in that direction. At 1025, one officer on Cataneo's bridge saw large warships off the bow, and it turned out that Cataneo was unwittingly crossing Cunningham's T. Cunningham reacted rather quickly and swung his ships around to engage the Italians. At 1028, when HMS Greyhound switched on her searchlight, an officer on Zara's bridge said, Why is he using his searchlight? Is he mad? Within moments, the ship was taken under fire. This next quote comes from Dark Seas, the Battle of Cape Matapan. The next few moments were decisive. The CNC altered course to starboard, bringing the fleet again into a single line ahead. Almost at the same time, Greyhound, which was then drawing ahead, opened her searchlight. Its beam fell right across the water, most valuably illuminating a cruiser without revealing the position of our battleships. The formidable, being obviously of no value in a gun action, hauled out of line to starboard. The Warspite's turrets opened fire, followed almost immediately by the Valiants. A salvo of 15-inch shells crashed into the Fiume. Her after turret was blown overboard, she listed heavily to starboard and burst into a sea of flame. She was driven out of line and seems to have sunk or blown up 30 minutes later. Just before the enemy cruisers were sighted, the barm in the rear of the line had sighted the Pola on the port quarter, making identification signals, and had trained her turrets onto her. When the Greyhound searchlight shone out, the barm trained forward at once, opening fire on the leading ship. Brilliant orange flash shot up under her bridge, and bursts were along the whole length of the ship, which turned to starboard and made off to the westward, making smoke. Following this, Italian destroyers tried to get into the engagement, but due to the concentrated firepower of the British ships, they were not very effective. Between 1029 and 1032, Zara was hit on the port side by four 15-inch salvos and just as many 6-inch salvos from Warspite five 15-inch salvos from Valiant, and one from Barham, all of this from a range of about 3,000 meters. A high proportion of rounds hit their target, about 20 out of 62 or so fired from the various guns, according to British estimates. Zara was hit in the bow and amidships. Turret 1 was destroyed, the muzzles of the guns of Turret 2 were deformed, the structures of the bridge were damaged, and the night fighting posts were unable to be attended to. The secondary armament and the other weapons were wrecked on the port side. This all came with a considerable loss of life, and more were lost in the ensuing fires that came, breaking out in the middle of the ship. 
As a precaution, magazines were ordered to be flooded, although it is not clear if this was actually carried out. Two boilers were completely destroyed in the machinery spaces, others damaged, and some were in operational condition. However, not even all of them could be manned due to the loss of life. The ship also had no power at this point, and the operational rear turrets couldn't traverse to get into position to fire. The ship was still afloat and theoretically could make steam, eventually at least, and steer with great difficulty, but with the loss of so much of the crew, it would be difficult. Captain Luigi Corsi ordered helm hard to starboard while under fire, and for a while, Zara continued to move slowly. This was stopped by Admiral Cataneo, who having ascertained the impossibility of saving the ship and avoiding the risk of an enemy boarding, decided to abandon the ship without waiting for the dawn, and therefore to sink the ship by explosive charges. The evacuation took place in the early morning of the 29th, and the explosives were placed in the forward magazine. The ship capsized to starboard around 2.30 in the morning. Cataneo and Corsi were lost with Zara, along with 35 other officers. 129 non-commissioned officers, 23 civilians, and 619 sailors. The other two Italian heavy cruisers, Fiume and Pola, were sunk as well. I'll close out with the same quote I opened with. The four Zara-class ships were surely the best Italian heavy cruisers, and the exceptional conditions of the loss of Zara and Fiume at Matapan, wrecked by 15-inch shells at almost point-blank range, do not allow for a fair judgment of the robustness to be made. At the Battle of Spartivento, Pola hit the cruiser HMS Barrack with two 8-inch shells, knocking out one of her 8-inch turrets. In the brief gunfire action of the First Battle of Sirte in December 1941, Gorizia damaged the destroyer HMS Kipling with a near miss. Zara was a truly beautiful ship like other Regia Marina designs. Just like her other sister sunk at Matapan, it isn't fair to judge their robustness based on this action. Thank you all for watching, and please remember to like and subscribe as it'll help the channel to grow. Until next time, my friends, have a great week.